Yeah, transitional justice. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And the handsome young man is Michael Davis. Um, Michael Davis joins us to talk about China, uh, rather Hong Kong and China. Uh, Michael is an American academic who serves as a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington. Uh, he's professor of law and international affairs at Jindal Global University in India, senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asia Institute at Columbia University. He's a widely sought after scholar on human rights in Asia. A long, he was a longtime professor uh, in comparative public law at the University of Hong Kong, knows Hong Kong very well. And, um, and he testified in Congress uh, very recently, along with three or four other people in front of a commission. And the commission was called the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. And he was uh, the lead speaker. Uh, a woman named Angela Dot was there from Freedom House. Maureen Thorson, a lawyer, I guess, on customs law considerations. Um, and I think, oh, and Samuel Chu uh, was there too. And a very interesting group. I think Michael was uh, one of two lawyers in that group, and he was the most authoritative on, on what's happening with the national security law in, in Hong Kong and how it is uh, devastating democracy there. Welcome to the show, Michael. Uh, thank you, Jay. Happy to be here on this uh, transitional justice show, as we've done some other ones in your global uh, forum. Transitional injustice, don't you think? That's what I, I suggested to them when they approached me, that term. Because <laughs> usually transitional justice is going from authoritarianism to an open society, and this is going in the opposite direction. It's hard to make sense of it, isn't it? Uh, you know, you, you want to you connect the dots beyond the immediate uh, issue, the immediate uh, 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 phenomenon. Um, but but it's hard to do that here because it's sui generis, isn't it? It's just Hong Kong. Now you can say this happened in Tibet, and uh, PRC wants it to, to happen elsewhere, um, and uh, Xinjiang, for example, and Mongolia. But 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 somehow Hong Kong is different. Hong Kong is a democracy where every was a democracy where everyone was enjoying the democracy and freedom of speech and the rule of law, and in a fairly short period of time say five years, it has all declined. And now is there any hope for Hong Kong? Well, that's the thing. I mean, it wasn't obviously a full democracy. That's why protesters were protesting uh, in 2019 there. And, and we've talked about this in other programs that you've had, but uh, it was an open society and had all the guarantees of the rule of law and human rights that you expect in an open society. It was a very open society, one that was ranked among the most free societies in the world. Its rule of law was ranked near, near the top of the world as well. So it had all the characteristics, including the economy of a first world uh, country. Uh, and China took it back, uh, committing itself to maintaining these things at least for 50 years. I guess the idea was after 50 years, maybe China and, and Hong Kong would both enjoy this status. Uh, but uh, China was dragging its feet over it. Uh, it. It put in provisions in the basic law that was, was uh, enacted for Hong Kong so that China would have the ultimate say. Uh, and the Chinese leaders are just not used to running an open society. So they, you know, they just couldn't give in to the idea that people would speak freely in this society and do what they want. Uh, and so it kind of used the government that it put in place, uh, which was supposed to be transitional until full democracy was established. It used that government to manipulate the situation. And those officials were always beholden to Beijing. So the end result is you get a very complicit government and out on the street are the people because the people have no avenue to have their voices heard except on the street in protest uh, and what are they demanding? Well, there are a lot of different things over the years, but always democratic reform because they wanted a government that would represent them, that would speak for them. I don't think they were asking for a government that would go to war with Beijing. They just wanted a government that would find its voice and represent their concerns and help Beijing officials to do the right thing for this society. And it's a big tragedy 
because there's been no society, at least in our lifetime, that was so fully developed that was basically turned over to a hardline regime. I mean, we all watched the tragedy uh, the past week in, in Afghanistan, the past couple uh, weeks in Afghanistan. Uh, and that was tragic enough where at least some movement towards an open society had been taking place. And then now the, there's a threat that it will all be taken away. But those people had never enjoyed anything like Hong Kong. And, and because of Hong Kong's unique status in this regard, I think much of the world sees itself in, the, in Hong Kong. It's like looking in the mirror and what would happen to your society under these conditions. Well, you know, um, I was thinking that as, as a lawyer, you know, maybe sometimes you have to look at the other side of it and see what you would do if you were on the other side of it, you know, on either side of a civil case, what have you, a nego negotiation and the like. Um, and I tell you, my reaction to what, and, and you and I have talked about this before, sort of on the path to 2047, let's get there sooner, they say. Let's get there right now, they say. Mm -hmm. We've had enough umbrellas. We're going to come down hobnail boots on the Hong Kongers. Okay, and, and if you were running it from Beijing, could you have done a better job at suppressing and squashing all that freedom, all, all that rule of law, all that openness and energy and vitality in Hong Kong? Could you have done a better job? They did a brilliant job in destroying the open society in Hong Kong, didn't they? Well, they have. And, and of course, if I were advising them, uh, as I have advised them in my many writings over the years, uh, often I write almost as if that's the audience and I want them to understand uh, what's happening. I would have said, you, you know, Newton law, Newton's law applies. If you put pressure on people, then they're going to push back. Uh, and if you want the society to be peaceful and in a cooperative and get along, uh, then you probably have to be willing to not put all that pressure on them. But what I think is happening, and I think this is important to us all, we all know there's a sort of global debate going on now, uh, a sense that there's a competition between uh, liberal democracies on the one hand and authoritarian regimes on the other. And one of the arguments that comes up very often is that this is being led on the authoritarian side by Beijing and Beijing wants to impose its model on, on other societies as an alternative to Western liberal democracy. And if you uh, listen to Xi Jinping's speeches, you see that he really does envision this from time to time in his comments uh, that China will offer a better model. But I don't think the model they would offer would be that they would expect all countries to have a communist party take over Rather, I think they, they, they envision a model in, in that rhetoric they use that we won't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. They envision rather that simply that whatever Beijing could do in their country and is doing, that these countries and their leaders would control that and make sure those people weren't out there protesting against Beijing's behavior and so on. And if you imagine that to be what they're after, then, Hong Kong looks a lot like their model that they're in a sense putting in place in Hong Kong. And, and, and it, it takes more time than we have today. But if you go through all the, check through all the points uh, in this national security law they passed, it looks, it's very comprehensive. It, it checks all the, the boxes. And, and so it's not simply, well, you guys can have a more authoritarian model and shut up the opposition. It's much more elaborate than that. It explains how that, what that authoritarian model looks like. And, and so this transition away from an open society uh, is being offered, I think, as a model that others can uh, learn from. Sure. And you know, when you think of Belt Road and when you think yeah. of other uh, countries over which China has economic influence and may have greater than economic influence, uh, de depending on you know, how fragile, uh, how stable those countries are. Um, maybe they're going to try to sell this model elsewhere. You know, one of the most interesting things that I heard you say in Congress was this. Uh, somebody asked whether what was happening in Hong Kong was better, worse, or the same uh, than is happening or would happen on mainland China. 
And your answer was, no, Hong Kong is worse. It's worse. And I thought that was very interesting. And the reason was, uh, you know, according to the discussion there in Congress, was that um, this is th the steps that uh, the PRC is taking are calculated to avoid protest. And uh, so you need to take more draconian steps in order to avoid protest. Can you talk about that? Yeah, because what you're in the mainland, as I even use the example of Afghanistan, you're not yet dealing in a society that has experienced uh, uh, free press and free speech and everything. So putting the genie back in the bottle, putting those freedoms away, taking them away is a more aggressive act than simply not allowing them uh, in the mainland, I would assume, and there's some support, at least from opinion polls, it's not based on the fact that the society has alternatives available and a free debate about it, but at least people think their life is better than it was maybe 30, 40 years ago on the mainland, that things have improved. So they're looking at what's going on and what the regime does through that lens, where Hong Kong people are looking at it through a very different lens. Uh, and, and I think that that's quite, quite important. And, and, and it's the kind of thing that I think societies that face this thing, and you mentioned the Belt and Road. Well, the Belt and Road in Sri Lanka means that they take over a, a port completely because the debt is not paid on it, on the money that was spent to, to do this construction. And then people might protest against it. Well, if they do, maybe Beijing would be interested in having something like we see in Hong Kong, where people are being arrested and, and stopping from, from expressing their opposition. Another interesting comment you made to Congress was that when you have this kind of experience and you look at the, call it the economic side, the business side, you know, because you have, you have the, the common folk, uh, the young generations, and then you have the business, the business community in Hong Kong, different, different interests, different approach, Different approach by the, the PRC, but um, the one thing that I that I recall that struck me was that what they're doing, what the PRC is doing, is actually generating corruption in the business community. Yeah. And can you talk about that? I think that's very interesting. Yeah, that, that came up because one of the the uh, commissioners had read an article that was published by a, actually a journalist from Hong Kong about that being Hong Kong being two societies, the, the ordinary people and then the sort of business community and the business community in this vision uh, that the opinion piece, it was in the Washington Post. I think the author was Rick Berg, if I recall his name correctly, the, was that the business community is all happy with whatever Beijing is doing because they're gonna make money. And I suggested that maybe they shouldn't be so happy and, and that, there's cause not to be happy. I pointed out that some of them have expressed that because we know opinions poll was done in the American Chamber of Commerce and 40% of the members said they were gonna move out of Hong Kong. So that, that's one thing. We know that a thousand people a day are moving out of Hong Kong. Uh, that's reported in data that, that's available. So, so there's obviously some people on the high end that can afford to go who are not happy. But I think one of the things that I wanted to stress in my response was that you in under this model that Beijing's introducing, where you can't criticize the regime and where you're pressured to support its initiatives, its actions, then what if you don't? If you if you don't satisfy them sufficiently, and you may not, because you're regulated by other foreign governments as well who's saying you shouldn't be supporting repressive policies and so on. Or if you do, you'll face uh, some kind of legal uh, problem as a result. So the, the result is that you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And so those who go along to get along are, are rewarded and those who don't uh, are not. Well, that's corruption. Yeah. <laughs> Plain yeah. and simple. <laughs> Yeah. Now, you know, one thing we, we need to discuss, I mean, there's so many things to discuss, uh, you know, just just uh, looking at that uh, video of, of the congressional hearing and reading the paper that you submitted. There's so many issues here. But one issue I find very interesting, and I want to mention it to you, and it's actually come from one of our viewers in Singapore, 
So this would not be somebody from Hong Kong, yeah. Singapore, okay? A different society. And uh, she says, so was Hong Kong ever really a democracy to begin with? You, you alluded to that earlier. Uh, how did they fare all these years without being a complete democracy? Do you think that Western, this is the operative part of the question, do you think Western hands have a part to play in the protests? And do you think Western hands should have a part to play uh, in what goes on now um, in terms of trying to deal with the uh, draconian steps that the PRC is taking against uh, Hong Kong? Where is the West on all of this? Yeah, well, we're, what we discussed in the hearing and this issue of colonialism came up. Uh, clearly, the British form of colonialism in its early years, uh, 1840s, all the way up to World War II, was pretty much uh, textbook colonialism with white guys running everything and uh, Asians there, probably because there are some economic opportunities, but not invited much into the government. So it's only after World War II and the UN and uh, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, anti-colonial uh, provisions in the UN Charter that this starts reforming and it becomes a much more of an open society and more and more local people are invited to participate in the government to the point by the time the handover occurs, some of the legislators are elected, but the, the colonial governor is still appointed. So th there's no question about it that, that that's colonialism. And China comes in more or less on a similar model, uh, controlling who's the chief executive, but promising something much more. Uh, the thing about it, though, is under the British colonial rule, the British system of the rule of law was introduced and the basic freedoms and so on under the rule of law. Uh, eventually, this takes the form of a Bill of Rights, which was literally a photocopy of the ICCPR. Uh, there, was, there were calls in the 80s already. I was there for democratic reform, and some of it occurred at first uh, a limited number of legislators and then direct elections and so on. So all of, of this is going on. The last colonial governor starts speeding that up a bit, but China was telling them, in fact, China was telling Britain long ago not to follow the UN Charter provisions that called for self-determination because Hong Kong was to remain part of China and not to have that choice. Uh, so you have basically a very open society without democracy, but in effect, the openness being guaranteed by an outside power, the British, and then eventually under the Sino-British Treaty and the basic law by the Chinese themselves, a very peculiar thing, guaranteeing the basic freedoms uh, in Hong Kong without democracy. But what happens is the people quickly discover that you need uh, some kind of democracy if you're going to guard the autonomy that was given to Hong Kong. And that's why you have them on the street protesting uh, and that the Chinese government, because, I mean, why they have one country, two systems is because they don't have basic freedoms. They don't have the rule of law. So it's kind of a, a, a risky proposition if you don't have some local government that can represent the people. So democracy becomes an urgent matter under this arrangement that it hadn't been so much under the British colonial rule. And one of the things you take away from all of this to make a long story short is the Hong Kong people more or less kind of liked the British colonial structure more than what they got now. That's why you see them carrying British flags and so on. And I think a class I had years ago kind of said it so succinctly. I asked them, what would, this was 1985, one year after the sign of British Joint Declaration. I said, do you like that joint declaration? Is that what you want? What would you want if you were asked? And first the class I was teaching refused the question, said that nobody asked us. And then the second they found, I said, I said, come on, humor me. What would you go for? And interestingly, they said they would return Hong Kong to China and then hire the British to run it. <laughs> which, which is very indicative that they had, at that point, they're not hostile to China. China had to build up that hostility by its behavior subsequently, yeah. but they did not trust the Chinese government. 
And in, surprisingly, they actually trusted the British government to get it right, to preserve their freedom to leave and come and go, to speak as they choose and so on. So this is kind of why they might be carrying around British flags in protest in 2019 and 2014 and so on. Uh, the British were not perfect by a long shot, but in, in the context of Hong Kong colonialism, probably did not have as bad a name. And I, I suppose because people contrasted Hong Kong with the rest of China. And so colonialism came off not so bad. I'm sure they, I'm sure they're nostalgic for the good old days right now, <laughs> uh, because it's you know the, it's crushing when yeah. you hear all the news, including all the points you've discussed in Congress. Um, but I want to ask you one thing. You and I have talked about you know the timeline here and how China is advancing the timeline for reasons we should we should discuss as as are being revealed. Um, but I wanted to ask you this. We have seen in Afghanistan, you mentioned Afghanistan, that over a 20 year period, you have a whole new generation come up and, and a substantial percentage of the population was born within that 20 years in that in that 20 year generation. <clears throat> so here we are uh, and it's 2021. And if you back this up a few years, uh, say we started the new generation, say in, in 2019. And so, Ed, you know that, so that's, um, we, we're getting 20, 20 years from that, okay? Will these people, these vital, young, um, freedom-loving people who are now so unhappy, will they remember or will this all be gone by the passage of time under the heel, under the boot uh, of Beijing? Well, this is a very a worrying question. As you know, I have a daughter who is of that generation that was born after the handover. She had just written the book about it and you, you had a show on this. Uh, and so that's the kids that we've been seeing in the street. That's the generation we've been seeing in the street. And almost all of the prominent ones that were taking a leading role in the protest in 2019 are now in jail and those who aren't in jail are often fleeing to get out of Hong Kong because they suspect they will soon be caught. And Beijing has put in its new electoral model. This is something done beyond the national security law. Uh, provisions to block any opposition figures from uh, being able to even run for office. There's all this vetting of candidates, sort of like the, the Guardian Council in, in Iran does uh, to approve who runs for office. So the conditions on the ground are very hostile to sustaining the kind of passions uh, the young people of Hong Kong have. And at the same time, they're very aggressively trying to change the education system, taking away courses where critical thinking are encouraged and substituting courses where students are uh, taught national security, or even teaching national security apparently in the kindergarten. Uh, the students be aware of it. And so this, you know, this is what happened after 1989 in China. I was in Beijing uh, in those days uh, for, from time to time. And they, they started re-educating the youthful generation uh, and, and giving the sim similar kind of educational uh, guidance for, for teaching them. And that sort of erased a lot of the passion that drove the 1989 protest in China. So the chances that that might happen in Hong Kong are, are, are significant. That, that uh, the, clearly the design of all this uh, intrusion into academic freedom is to make sure that the, uh, what is viewed as a wrongful path of Hong Kong youth is corrected. It's all out of uh, 1984 um, yeah. and Orwell. So one of the things that uh, Sam, Samuel Chu said, or was it, no, it was Alex Wan, who was one of the Congress, Congress people yes. there on the commission, which, which is really chilling. He said, quote, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Right. And I think that could happen anywhere. It could happen here in the United Absolutely. States. Absolutely. Yeah, that's I mean, someone uh, one of those pro Beijing figures in Hong Kong actually often like to point out that Hitler was elected 
Now, she was doing that to dismiss the idea of democracy at all. You know, even democracies elect uh, the wrong people and, and freedoms are lost. Uh, but, you know, th this just tells you that if we're not up to the task of guarding it, and if, uh, or if we're not allowed to guard it, as in the case of Hong Kong, then uh, those kinds of values can be lost. The chief executive of Hong Kong at one point confronted with the dissatisfaction of the youth and the fact that Hong Kong, a lot of families were sending even their young kids abroad to study in boarding schools so that they're not brainwashed. Uh, she said, well, if Hong, people move out of Hong Kong, China has over a billion people, we can always find new people to replace them. So this is... This is yeah, that's, that's real politic. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, the problem is, uh, you know, what can, oh, the problem, when the last time you and I spoke was before some of these things that she has been doing have been revealed. Yeah. Um, so more, more recently, he's, he's come down on tutoring on the mainland. Yes. They're yeah. very interesting. And he's pronounced himself uh, more Mao than Mao was Mao. Yeah. Um, and he is uh, making all these noises about taking over Taiwan and the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, which yeah. is you know critical in chips. Um, he's been tougher and tougher on Xinjiang. So I mean, things have happened since you and I last talked, Michael. And I and mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, whether this we can see through a combination connecting the dots for all these things that she has been doing. Um, a larger pattern, a larger strategy, and how that strategy includes and affects Hong Kong. Oh yeah, I, it has a huge effect. Hong Kong now has largely become very much in the middle of the Sino-US struggle or conflict as we would call it. Uh, and even the other day, the Chinese leader in the, their foreign ministry was telling the US representative, which was uh, John Kerry, uh, that, well, we're not going to talk about, the, you know, things like climate change and stuff on which we could work together as long as you're uh, having policies that intrude in our internal affairs in Hong Kong and Xinjiang and so on. So uh, they've tied these things together. So it, it's going to make it difficult. Uh, and this was uh, very much in the news that it's going to make it very difficult for the two countries to cooperate over vital concerns. Mm. Uh, and so that's where we are right now. And Hong Kong is very much in the middle of it. So what can we do? It was, it was troubling to hear from your panel in Congress that I think uh, Samuel Chu did mention this, that some, some fellow wanted to escape Hong Kong, got in a boat and uh, headed toward Taiwan. And he was uh, arrested for mm, wrongful passage or some kind of uh, you know ridiculous crime like that, yeah. and he's in jail now. Um, so it's hard to leave Hong Kong. H how how hard or easy is it to leave Hong Kong, and what role can the United States play in in bringing people out of Hong Kong, and will that really help? Yeah, I think it is important because the leverage on China has to be improved. I think the the sort of unilateral pressure of Trump was putting on China really doesn't work. China just works with other countries and gets around that and does a lot of whataboutism about the US and its own history of human rights abuse and so on and gets us nowhere. So uh, I think multilateralism is one part of the answer to, to work together on international standards of behavior. And, and the second is because uh, the people of Hong Kong can't wait uh, just like the people of Afghanistan can't wait, is to have some kind of policy in our immigration uh, uh, laws that would allow them uh, to come to the United States. Uh, Canada has a policy, for example, that says people who have Canadian degrees can immigrate uh, from, from Hong Kong. So the U.S. might have policies like this, and, and it can only benefit us because uh, our, we have an aging population and we're talking about people with talent that could come to our country. And I think, so it's a win-win case for us. And so these kinds of issues I think have come up in those discussions in Congress 
about how to address the problems. Uh, some people, even Biden, President Biden has uh, said that those uh, in, in Hong Kongers in the US can stay on longer and get jobs and work. So if they're studying in the US, they can choose that route. So these are things that have to be explored. Yeah, and he increased uh, the immigrant visa, or rather the non-immigrant visa, to 18 months for Hong Kongers. Uh, yeah, that's recently. right. And now the question is whether Congress will act to give a, some kind of special immigration category for Hong Kongers and let them stay longer, yeah. uh, let them become uh, not, you know, uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, yeah. That would be that would be very good, and and I agree with you. There's all kinds of benefits to that, and I'm hoping that Congress can get its act together on that and many other things. But beside the U.S., you know, last time we spoke, we spoke about the U.K. program, yeah. uh, where the U.K. was allowing a certain a certain number of Hong Kongers in on a special visa. How is that doing? And what other countries are being sympathetic to the problem? Uh, so as to either A, allow immigrants, or B, make a global statement, uh, maybe the United Nations, somebody who will speak up about this. Well, there is some, a lot of speaking up, but then the putting action behind the words is, is the challenge. I know the EU uh, uh, has made some statements and the agreements they reached with China have been put on hold, I think, because of Xinjiang as much as Hong Kong. The British model is, is a very favorable one. Uh, I'm not sure of the data on taking it up, but it basically says that any Hong Konger uh, who can qualify for a B&O passport, that's a British national overseas passport, which would be any Hong Konger born before July 1st, 1997, that they can uh, immigrate to Britain under a five-year visa and establish permanent residence and citizenship. So that, that reaches, I think, about 3 million people. So that, that, that's a major program, and I, one that's appropriate given British colonial history and that Britain is part of the agreement. I know there are people exploring ways that Britain can bring uh, that, that might be able to bring China before tribunals or, or whatever, but that road is very much closed. There's not much you can do. The ICE, International Court of Justice is only available if the country agrees to it and China would not. So we see, we're seeing a, a citizens tribunal for the Uyghurs uh, being conducted in Britain. Uh, so I don't know if something like this will come up in future uh, efforts to promote Hong Kong. Well, I think uh, you know the 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 basic um, basic strategy has to be to keep the issue alive, yes, and, and not let let it settle down into some sort of um, status quo sort of thing where um, nobody cares anymore. That that's the greatest risk of all. Yeah. And uh, I know that you're doing a, a, a yeoman job in getting the word out. Uh, your daughter wrote the book. Uh, your family is involved. That's fabulous. Um, and I think, you know, we all have to have these programs. We all have to write those books and articles and so forth. Um, but one thing that came up in, in the congressional hearing that, that interested me was to establish an undersecretary for relations with Hong Kong uh, in the Department of State. Uh, and everybody felt the same way about it, but uh, your thought was that that would be a good idea. Uh, can you can you talk about that and and the value of a program of a, of a, the creation of a, uh, a high level undersecretary for that purpose? Yeah, well, that's what the, I I it was actually an idea put forth by one of the commissioners who who, who has been a senator, uh, and uh, it was new to me this idea that it would be done. So I was reacting on the spot, uh, but my thought was that if you have an advocate for Hong Kong in the State Department, uh, then I, I would think that that could help do what you just said, sustain attention to the issue uh, and work with Congress and, and, and those in Congress that constantly uh, are paying attention and want to promote the issue. I, I would think such a, a person in such a role could be very helpful to that. Now, I raised the question whether they could actually do that as including Hong Kong and, and the Uyghur situation. Uh, and, and, and well, they would have to decide the limits, Tibet or Taiwan, uh, sort of China's periphery, uh, whether that 
would be better. I guess it would be a matter of determining just how much uh, time would be taken in each of these areas uh, or whether it would be better to keep them separate. And I have had not thought that through yet. You know, here's a question. It's, it's my last question, Michael. Um, we're running out of time, but um, then I always ask you, I always ask you this question. And, yeah. and, and each time I ask you, the, the answer is perhaps um, a little more scary. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Where are we going on this? What are your predictions for the next five, 10 years? Uh, what are your expectations from the PRC and the resilience of the uh, the you know the, the the democracy democracy community in Hong Kong uh, and for that matter the world around Hong Kong who can mm, speak to this issue. I think it, it it's it is a grim prospect at the moment. Uh, they are so uh, comprehensive in their repressive strategies to arrest people who do anything to prohibit anyone who has an opposition voice from even running for office. They have a committee to vet anybody and the, everyone who chooses to run can subject themselves to, will subject themselves to an investigation by the police. Uh, and again, put themselves at risk of being arrested for some kind of national security violation. And, and that's very serious. So I think they, they are, are closing down Hong Kong as we know it. Uh, and a lot of the, the voices that speak out are in jail and, or overseas. And when they're overseas, they endeavor to speak out for, for their friends. I mean, many friends of mine are now in jail in Hong Kong. And these are really good people that have worked so hard for the society. So uh, that, that's very discouraging, I think, the, the prospects for the next five years. The only hope is, I suppose, is at, on some macro level, there's some uh, change of direction in Beijing. Uh, and uh, in some ways, Beijing now has put uh, the onus on it for sustaining Hong Kong, where before uh, Hong Kong was sustaining itself. So I, I just don't, we can't predict that. We know Xi Jinping has appointed himself a president for life. And I guess he has more life in him from the looks of it. So, <laughs> so this is going to be a long, long uh, ordeal, I think. It's, it's transitional justice the wrong way. That's what yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Michael Davis is uh, an American academic who serves as a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Institute Center for uh, Scholars in Washington and who has years and decades uh, of experience in teaching in Hong Kong, constitutional law, the rule of law. He is a, he is a treasure to, the, uh, to Hong Kong and to the history of Hong Kong and very likely to the future of Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. And thank you for uh, your attention to Hong Kong. It's much appreciated. Aloha. Thank you.